And in all the early years of leprosy care, the research, the advances were being done by Christians who were at the cutting edge of this. They were the ones who were there reaching the need, most needy and the poorest of the poor. They would, why were they doing that? Because they had compassion for people and they'd love for Jesus Christ. Welcome to The Same Commission, a podcast discussing all things mission, but from a new angle. I'm Jim Armstrong. And I'm Matt Pitts. And we're with the Christian Mission Service Group, Echoes International. And so we'd like to welcome you today to The Same Commission. Each week, we'll be getting to know a new guest on the podcast who is involved in a particular aspect of mission. And we'll hear about their ministry and we'll also reflect on a different facet of mission globally. Perhaps you're thinking about mission for the first time. Or perhaps you've been faithfully supporting or serving in mission for many years. Well, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to today's episode of the Same Commission. Um, thank you for joining us. And with us today is our guest, Dr. Ian Burnless. And for the observant amongst you, Matt and I are wearing the same shirt because <laughs> we're in the same podcast we did earlier, just and, in case. And so if you would like to write in and <laughs> as, as an avid listener, yeah. you can you can you can tell us which podcast we were just recording. Um, yes, anyway, answers on a postcard or Twitter or something. Anyway, after studies in in medicine at Aberdeen University, Ian and his wife Margaret went to Africa in 1979, uh, where Ian ran a mission hospital on the Zambian-Angola border and also worked amongst local churches. And then after returning to the UK in 1990, Ian worked for Echoes of Service, now Echoes International, uh, based here in Bath, and uh, he was our general director until 2015. Um, he's also published a variety of books and is a, a real uh, a real historian of the missionary movement. So it's fantastic to have him with us today. It's very good to join you for this uh, occasion. I hope it goes well. I'm sure it will. It was good to have you. And we're here in the Bath office, which I'm That's sure right. you'll recognise, but right. it's quite different looking. It's a bit different shape. My my office used to be upstairs above this and uh, Andy Street was down there, but it's nice to be back in the old place. Yeah, well, It's good to have you. Mm. So today's podcast theme is positive impact on mission or of mission, which in some respects as a believer you don't really need to consider talking about it, but actually um, some people would probably question some of the positive impact. So we want to try and look at that today, yep. both from a, a Christian's perspective, but also many non-believers would question mission and colonialism yep. and all the stuff that goes on. So it'll be good to try and expo explore some of that and unpack some of that today as well. Yeah, and we'll largely look at the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, which is often really seen as a time of, of revival and zeal for, for missionary efforts. But it's also a time at which a lot of criticism, as, as Jim said, has been levelled, um, particularly around missionary practices and, uh, and, and the kind of perceived attitudes of, of missionaries going out during that time. And yet it is definitely accurate to say that the UK is now benefiting from mission partners coming yep. from many former British colonies Indeed. and yes. uh, and that is that is no accident and they are evangelizing in the UK now and it's also not every secular opinion that's critical Matthew Paris who is often quite quite critical of Christian theology uh, wrote an article which with, with quite a striking striking title back in 2008 as an atheist I truly believe Africa needs God. Yes. Missionaries, not aid money, are the solution to Africa's biggest problem. Yes, indeed. I remember reading that article and uh, being very impressed by what he said. Mm. And for someone who is an atheist, it was a very fascinating piece mm. of writing. Mm. Mm. So we're delighted to have you um, and to discuss this. We've, we've described it as a complicated mm. topic. Before we start, just give us a little bit of your history and your ministry over the years. Yeah. Uh, I suppose my... Long-term interest in mission started when I was at med school, uh, really in first year med school, because there were other Christians in my year, and we used to meet for a Bible study at lunchtime uh, at that time, and uh, we would talk about the future, and mission came into the conversation, so it was there. And I grew up in a local church where mission was very much in front of us as well. Most months, there would be one mission worker coming to report on their work. So we were constantly drip-fed mission. It was there. 
And then my father was a full-time Christian worker, gospel evangelist, and so it, it was it was before us. And so all through med school, the interest was there, and it grew, and it led to us formalizing our calling in a sense at a, a few st- years later uh, after graduation I did postgraduate training for a few years wanted to go back to a mission hospital where I could act solely as the physician the, the general physician which was my interest but then when God moved us in a different direction I had to broaden my training so I eventually reached there after a few years of postgraduate training we wanted to go to Angola that was our burden that was our interest but in 79 there was a war there and we didn't feel it was right to commit a young family because we had two young children at that point to the irregularities and the war situation in Angola. But we served nearby and for a few years I was able to visit there, do some medical clinics, do some Bible teaching because it was the same language of our area until that border closed. These were fascinating years. I look back at them now at this advanced stage of life with a great deal of nostalgia. You forget the the bad experiences, of course, and you think of the good. But they were, it was a wonderful opportunity the Lord gave us, but we equally felt it was right for us to return to the UK in 1990 because we had adolescent children and we felt that during adolescence we should be with them. Their spiritual, not only their education, but their spiritual maturity was part of our responsibility. So uh, probably when I left Africa in 1990, that was the most difficult decision of my life, actually, Mm -hmm. because I was enjoying the work. I was uh, fulfilled in what I was doing. I was able to teach the scriptures in the local language and being fulfilled in many ways, but we felt that for family care and education, we should come back. And we wondered what God would have for us. Uh, Just before we were leaving to come back, Peter Grovner, who at that time was the senior man at Echoes of Service, as it was called in those days, not Echoes International, uh, visited us and uh, said to me, Ian, what are you doing when you go back to the UK? And I said, well, we are probably go back into full-time medicine, but uh, we're open to what God wants us to do. And he said to me almost immediately, how about Echoes? And that put something in my mind that actually had been there before, believe it or not, because uh, I had thought over the years, Echoes was a good organization. We had developed a strong relationship with them. They were very supportive, but they don't have anyone in their team who's actually got long-term field experience and so I felt I could bring that to them. So after a couple of years back in Aberdeen we moved from Scotland to the Bath area and I worked full-time with Echo for 23 years. Now we're, we're going to be talking about the positive impact of mission and and so I guess my question is what are some of the positive impacts of mission over the years and that is a very big open mm-hmm. question mm-hmm. so it may be helpful perhaps to to zoom in a little bit, perhaps on on the the, the movement that the Echoes of Service, Echoes International, has come from, uh, perhaps the the brethren contribution yeah, to mission yeah, yeah. in recent years. But what would some of the the key uh, the key takeaways be? Yeah. Well, perhaps I can uh, illustrate this, shape my answer by two examples from my own experience uh, in our church at Jivuma when. I first went there, there was an old Christian evangelist, he'd been an evangelist for many years, called Daniel Sapindalo. And sometimes eh, when we were meeting together, he would rise and he would pray and he would say, Lord, we thank you for delivering us from the power of darkness. Well, that's a phrase that Christians often use. It comes from Colossians chapter 1 and uh, we might think no more of it. But if you actually went and sat down with Daniel Sapindala, he would tell you of how, as a young boy, he grew up in Angola. And in his village, if someone was becoming old or frail and a burden to the community, often that person would be accused of witchcraft. There'd be some sort of trial take place in the village. And generally the person was found guilty. They were taken to their hut. They were barricaded into the hut. It was set on fire and they were burned to death. The power of darkness. Mm -hmm. So when that man prayed, Lord, thank you for delivering us from the power of darkness, it was not a phrase. It was the reality. And what had delivered Sanyan Dapli was not getting a good education or learning a trade. He was a carpenter or 
getting more money in his pocket. It was the transforming impact of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I've never forgotten that. And I can still hear him praying today in the valley, Lord, deliver us from the power of darkness. And it, it always moved me when every time I heard it. Then I remember a uh, being on the top of Kalani Hill, which is also in Zambia with J- the late John Hoyt a number of years ago. John Hoyt, John Hoyt was the granddaughter of Dr. Walter Fisher, who was the pioneer missionary doctor who went into what was what became Northern Rhodesia and then Zambia and established a, a medical center at Kalani. When he first went there, the local people were not living in villages because the Arab slave trade was still active in Central Africa and slavery was still a reality. And slave caravan, people were being captured and sold by, in different circumstances to, uh, to the slave trade that was still active. And you're talking about really the beginning of the, 19th, the 20th century. And at night, Walter Fisher would sit on the top of Kalani Hill with a compass and he'd look at the forest round about him. He'd look for smoke and then he would take a compass reading perhaps more than one. The next day he would set out in that direction to try and encounter the people because they were not living in villages. They were scared to live in villages because of the slave trade. Mm. And he would try to meet them. He would try to come alongside them. He would befriend them. He would give them medical care. And this was the beginning of the penetration of the God. And Walter Fisher eventually built a large hospital there that served the community. Churches were planted. As schools were built. And the community was gradually transformed through the work of a man who ultimately wanted people to come to know the living God and be delivered from their fear and be delivered from all the darkness that they were into. I remember another experience just a few years ago being at Loanza, which is where Dan Crawford, well, great Scottish missionary name, served for many years. And on the top of the hill at Loanza, there's a cemetery. And in that cemetery, there are a row of graves of missionaries who were buried there. Dan Crawford's buried there. My great aunt, the first wife of Dougal Campbell, was buried there. She died as a young woman 11 days after giving birth to her second child and uh, is buried in that hill. So it was very moving to stand by her gravestone. The gravestone actually was cracked in half. So when I came back, I got the Campbell side of the family together and uh, we had a whip round and we sent some money out and a new stone was made in Lubumbashi and taken up and put in place by Africans in that lady's grave in Luanza. But there are some there, a, a young Scot, John Wilson, who died within two years of reaching Luanza. There are missionary children who are buried there who died of malaria. And when you walk along a row of graves like that, you think of the sacrifice and the cost. And what were they there for? Were they there trying to build an empire? Were they there trying to make money? They were sacrificing their lives to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the community. And when you go there now and you see vibrant, growing, living churches, you say, yeah, it has had an impact. There has been development over the years. And God has blessed the sacrifices of previous generations. You've mentioned some names there already. I guess my question following on from that, who are the kind of unsung heroes? If you walk into the late 1800s and the early 1900s, who would you highlight as folk who would stand out in taking the gospel to other parts of the world? There are some names that really impact me, some from the 19th, some from the 20th century. Uh, Inevitably, uh, a Christian doctor impacts me. She's a lady who actually grew up in Bristol, Dr Charlotte Pring. She obviously had a congenital problem with it. Probably she had a congenital dislocation of her hip, so she had mobility problems all of her days. And she went to India around about 1908, I think initially, and uh, saw that many of the women were dying because they would not consult a male doctor. It just was not done culturally, and many of the women were dying. So she came back in the early 1900s, she trained in medicine now. That's the beginning of the 20th century when it's very difficult for women to get into medical school. And she went back to India and in 1915, she started the hospital at Narsapur Christian Hospital. And she served there until the Lord took her home in 1953 and did an amazing job over that time. Latterly, she was so lame that when she was doing award rounds, they had to carry her from ward to ward in a seat because she could no longer walk properly. Uh, I visited her grave in Narsapur many years and was very impressed to to think about this lady from Bristol, what she gave for God. 
Uh, another of my heroes who didn't become a missionary, actually, was a businessman in London. His name was Huntington Stone, and he was the senior man in the Peak Freen Biscuit Company. So every time I have a bourbon cream, I raise it to Huntington <laughs> Stone. <laughs> Good choice to, to Huntington. There. That's right. Other biscuits are available. He was he was a very rich man. He inherited several fortunes, but he was deeply committed to mission. And he had a large house in Greenwich, and he lived in two rooms here. The rest of his house he used for accommodation for those who were doing training in mission before they went abroad. So over the years, hundreds of missionary candidates lived in his house, and very often he dipped his hand in his own pocket and he paid the fees for them to train at the East London Bible Institute. There was something similar happening in Glasgow too, and Huntington Stone contributed towards that as well. When he died, 1915 or 1916, I think he died, he left his fortune largely to echoes of service, that was two hundred thousand pounds then. That would probably be about twenty-four million, twenty-five million in today's money. money. Days, yeah. He said that it should be used up over ten years, and of course, the war years and the post-war depression led to a serious dip in giving for mission among Christians and churches in the UK. But Huntington Stone's money fed in during all these years, so there was never a dip in income. And when the money was exhausted, the giving had risen again. And, the, and so therefore, his provision for the work of God at that time was amazing. So he was never a cross-cultural missionary and not leaving the UK, although he knew a lot about mission, but he was a man who became a great benefactor to Christian work. And I think in the circles in which we have moved, you know, and that have supported Echoes over the years, many of the unsung heroes are the ordinary Christians mm -hmm. who generously give, who just dip their hands in their pocket and they give on a regular basis to support mission support missionary work and of course we remember the big benefactors the Huntington Stones the, the Sir John Langs and so on and these were key people but we must never overlook all those who have generously supported the work of God so they're great heroes too another hero of mine is a man who served in India called Percy Woodhouse he came from Birmingham and a uh, before he went to India in 1910, he was engaged to a young, he, had, he was friendly with a young lady in Birmingham and he invited her to marry him. And uh, she said, I will marry you, but I will not go with you to India. So he went to India, he served for 10 years and uh, returned to Birmingham for his first furlough. The young lady was still single, so he approached her again. And she said, my answer is the same. I will marry you, but I will not go with you to India. So he returned to India and for the next 40 years served God there, planted a huge church in the Rasul Tuluk area of Andhra Pradesh. And the thing that fascinates me, he is buried behind the church alongside an Indian worker called Reddy, who they worked together in the Lord's work there. And I thought that's a wonderful yeah. thing, what the gospel has done there. You have two evangelist missionaries, pastors, who are buried side by side, who serve God hand in hand in India and so they, they rest together awaiting the Lord's term. That is a really key point as well. Partnership in the gospel is so powerful, isn't it? And that's actually, um, by the time this podcast comes out, that will be our theme for the year. Yeah. Um, and that partnership, uh, not just often we think about mission organisations partnering with missionaries or mm. even churches partnering mm. with missionaries, but mm. actually just individuals yeah. who, are, who are those partners in the gospel as well. Just... I'd be keen to get your take on the the way in which mission or, uh, mission uh, projects or mission workers can sometimes drift. Uh, we published an article recently in our magazine with the title "Evangelical Missions Drift Towards Secularism, but Secularistic Organisations Never Drift into e Evangelical Mission." What do you think of of that statement? And um, what what do you, what would you say is distinctively different? between Christian mission and, huma uh, and humanitarian aid or uh, aid work, that kind of thing. Um, is there a danger that missionaries setting up hospitals and schools can drift away from, uh, from, from the core of, the, of, their, of their mission, mm -hmm. ultimately? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, it's, you're digging into a very deep but a very important area. Uh, and it's what is sometimes called in modern terminology mission creep. Yeah. Mm -hmm that we begin with a very clear focus and 
goal and what we're doing. And in time and over the years, drift away from that original vision and original calling. I suppose that hap- that can happen to us in an individual Christian life. If there's not a constant renewal, a constant daily recommitment of ourselves to Jesus Christ in the service. It's easy to drift and it's easy to to wander. Uh, and mission organizations, churches are liable to do this. If you know anything about church history in the UK, you will know that many denominations that began as thoroughly gospel-focused evangelical organizations sadly have drifted over the years. So there is a warning there for all of us. Well, it's a biblical warning, of course, in Hebrews, that we don't drift from the things that, that we hold on to. It's also looking at the whole area of the, the tension that sometimes can exist between what we call secular and sacred. And of course, in God's world, there's no difference between the two because we, we, we see the whole of life as God's life. So whether I am working, teaching children on a school day by day or working in an office, that is part of my service mm. for God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's what Paul says to the Colossians, and we have sadly divided life into sacred and secular, and we've devalued the secular because God is interested in both. And therefore, in service for God, really until the beginning of the 20th century, there wasn't a problem. Missionaries went to Africa. They wanted to take the gospel of Christ, but they saw people in uh, huge sorts of physical need, hungry, those who were medically sick, those who couldn't read or write, all of the things that they've set out to help. We used to have at Chivuma a little set of houses that belonged to widows because these widows, when they lost their husband, were taken there for care and protection from possibly being, you know, being put down in the village. So, 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 so there always has been, there wasn't a problem. It was only really at the beginning of the 20th century, when the social gospel and liberalism came along, the evangelicals began to retreat to some extent from this, retreat from social involvement. And there were perhaps good reasons for that, but they were trying to distinguish themselves from those who denied the gospel of Christ. There was a good correction to this uh, in the post-war years, and probably many people would look to Lausanne 1974, when there was an affirmation of both, that we are sent by Jesus Christ to make him known, to call people to faith and repentance and uh, salvation in Christ, but also to serve and meet human need. And we so we began to talk about holistic mission. Mm-hmm. Uh, nowadays, the terminology has moved on a little bit, and we rather use the term integral mission and I prefer that word because of course in our modern world holistic can mean all sorts of strange and holistic therapy and a lot of quackery is involved in holistic <laughs> therapy I'm speaking as a medic you know but it's amazing what it's amazing how gullible the public are but there we are <laughs> uh, but anyway uh, so so therefore we try to integrate all that we do. We don't see it as, you know, this is social and this is spiritual. I encountered that when I first went to Africa. Oh, that's social work you're involved in. We're just doing spiritual work. And well, it's all the Lord's work and it's service for people in Christ's name. So therefore he will honor it. But I think in anything else, there are pendulums, aren't they? Pendulums swing. You know, we make a correction and then we can overcorrect. Hmm. And I wonder sometimes if we have overcorrected in the holistic gospel spectrum. And so there was a debate in more recent years about gospel prioritism. And the person who's particularly top to this was David Hesselgrave. He wrote a book, uh, Paradigms in Conflict, a few years ago. And he said, if we do not give the gospel priority, it's very quickly, it's very easy to lose the gospel. And from what I've observed, I see that. I see that actually in different organizations that I've known over the years, that they have been, you know, they start off on their faith based and then faith becomes a value and then we affirm faith and then faith gets dropped out. So it's, 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 it's complicated. So I believe that we serve human need whenever we find it. And Christian missionaries have done that over the years and thank God for what they've done. I mean, one area that we were talking about earlier was an area of leprosy care. Yeah. Uh, last year, I earlier this year, I was at uh, Bethesda Leprosy Hospital in Narsapur for a centenary of the hospital operating there. 
And I read a little bit about the background and really, over the centuries, the only people who were caring for leprosy sufferers were Christians who set up hospices, who set up houses where they could be cared for. Very often, uh, uh, monks and nuns in the Middle Age cared for them and Christians became involved. And uh, it was an Irishman called Wellesley Bailey who was working in the Punjab, who saw the dreadful suffering of leprosy patients that went, who went back to Ireland and established what became the leprosy mission. And that's had a, had a huge impact. And in all the early years of leprosy care, the research, the, 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 the advances were being done by Christians who were at the cutting edge of this. They were the ones who saw human need. They were the ones who were willing to... Uh, treat a disease that many people turned away from because, you know, untreated leprosy in those days produced huge deformity and, and it was very unpleasant condition to, 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 to treat. But they were the ones who were there reaching the need, most needy and the poorest of the poor. They were, why were they doing that? Because they had compassion for people and they'd love for Jesus Christ. And many of these leprosy patients on the way came to know Jesus Christ and find his peace and salvation and forgiveness. Well, some inspirational stories there already. Uh, but before we go on to the next question, let's take a short break. Ready, set, go. Welcome to First Serve. A gap year like no other. Learn to serve serve local and serve global. It's so exciting and I would 100% recommend this programme to anyone. On my first serve gap year I'm most looking forward to experiencing other cultures and also speaking to other people about God. This is First Serve. Find out more at first-serve.org.uk Thank you for joining us again. This is the Same Commission podcast by Echoes International, and we're here with our guest, Dr. Ian Bunless, uh, who has been involved in mission for many years. Just picking up on that point, I guess, as a balance, it's right, because what was very interesting is the point you made where people were reacting to need. And I guess that really is the issue. If you, have, if you see there's a need, and obviously there's a gospel need, that's the reaction, really, you're looking for people who go to yes. actually react to yes. that's rather right. than their own agenda. You that's know? right. That's right. Well, it's, you know, an important verse for me is 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ controls us. Yeah. And that is the controlling factor in our motivation. It is Christ's love, uh, his love for me, and that should overflow in my love for others and yeah. my compassion that's for right. those who are in need, particularly those who are lost. Uh, it was John Piper who actually said in Cape Town in 2010, we as Christians should be concerned for all forms of human need, yeah. mm -hmm. but equally we should be concerned for people's eternal needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll never forget that people have an eternal destiny and we need to respond to that as well. And it was a very straight comment that he made that didn't, always, didn't necessarily go down too mm -hmm. well, but it was actually a very important statement. This is, a, a, I guess, a very cultural question. Um, should Christians be embarrassed about mission in the past? If you think of all that's going on uh, in our world today, and particularly in Western society, and it's mixed up with colonialism and all of the different bits that are affected by that, um, how do we distinguish between that and what the gospel has done and the changes that have been made? I think the answer to that is yes and no. Yeah. Uh, there is much that we can hold out as being a demonstration of great compassion and love for people demonstrated in action. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, many of the frontline heroes over the centuries have been Christian men and women who have gone not for their own interests, but yeah. for the interests of the, king, the advancement of the kingdom of God. So, so there's an answer in which, but yet there is an answer in which we can say yes, there is, there should, there is a degree of embarrassment because sadly, mission and empire have sometimes been linked together. There's no doubt about that. Uh, 
embarrassingly so in some parts of the world. Uh, if you want to look at this in more depth, uh, the book by Brian Stanley, The Bible and the Flag, is probably as good as anything. It's, a, it's several years old, that book now, but it's an excellent book looking at the whole relationship between Christianity, Christian mission and empire and colonialism. And he, again, gives good answers and shows how positive Christian mission has been, but yet sometimes the link has been too close. One of the things that interests me, if you look at history, is that at the beginning of Christian mission, Christian mission tended to be done to position of equality. Yeah. Uh, I'm a great uh, fan of David Livingston, uh, you know, who uh, was a great man. And uh, although there are some negative biographies about Livingston, I think overall the picture is very strong. But Livingston saw the Africans as his equals. Yeah and struggled with the attitude, particularly in South Africa, of the Boers, the, 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 the Dutch Reformed, who saw themselves there like the Israelites, you know, subduing the tribes of Canaan. That's how they, that was their theology for how they took over South Africa. You know, they were the new modern Israelites subduing the Canaanite evil tribes. Livingston, you know, stood in that position of regarding people as equal. And I think in the first half of the 19th century, that was largely the attitude. That was the attitude of William Carey. There was a covenant called the Serampur Covenant that Carey and his co-workers repeated every six months. And in that, he says, we must treat Indians as our equals because India will only be reached by Indians. Yeah. Again, the, for, the foresight that he had yeah. was amazing. But it's, you know, here is a man of the early... Uh, uh, early 19th century who, who says these things with great clarity. But as the empire began to develop and colonialism got into gear, the attitude began to change and uh, it, was, uh, it was what was uh, the British for, uh, yeah, Rudyard Kipling, Kipling, of course, talked about take up the white man's burden. This is what we had to do. We had to pick up the burden of these poor, benighted, less developed ignorant races. And of course, the, in North America, it was this sense of our manifest destiny. God has put us in the world a light to elevate everyone to just be like us, not just to come to Jesus Christ, but if they become like us, even so much better in the same way. So that mission moved at the end of the 19th century from being done on a ground of compassion for those in need to condescension. Here we are, we have so be God has blessed us in such a way. We're going to bless you. We're going to take you the gospel, but we're also going to make you like us along the same way. And therefore, you had this attitude that began to develop in the latter decades of the 19th century into the first decades of the 20th century. And you will see that in, if you read old letters in our magazines, yeah. you will see language. And what, what one must do is judge them as people of their time. These were common attitudes there. You mustn't criticize them. You must judge them as people of them. But that attitude can be there, the condescending attitude. And it's seen in some of our great missionary hymn hymnology, far, far away in heathen darkness dwelling. You know, and so in our thinking, we have almost seen that we are in a position of privilege and we can come alongside and lift these poor people up and make them like us. And this perhaps has been one of the less happy aspects of mission over these decades. You and I met up in India earlier this year. And when I was there, I was commenting on social media about the trip I was making. And I had a colleague who contacted me, my previous colleague from work, and they were basically criticising me because I was going to a country that had their own religion. And that also is creeping into mm, our society yeah, today. Yeah. And I guess what would be the response to that be? What's the biblical response to that? Well, well, the biblical response to that is that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. He is a, not only a person of history, but we believe he is alive. He is the risen Lord. He is the Lord of all. And therefore, he has commissioned us. Christianity has always been a missionary religion. It's not the only missionary religion. No. Other religions are missionary religions too. It's not the only one. So therefore, if we say that we're disciples of Christ and following him, then we should obey his commands and his commission. If he says, go make disciples of all the nations, that's a responsibility. If we're not making people disciples through coercion, no. sadly, as happened in 
a earlier centuries, particularly in the in the Americas when the Spanish yeah. went there as colonials, people were forced to become Christians, say under coercion. We should never coerce. We we call people to Christ, but we don't. For, we cannot force them to make that decision. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and I think that's it, it's been an interesting conversation actually so far because we've had the very much the positive, you know, the the overwhelming change from from darkness to light mm -hmm. that that, that uh, God's mission in this world has brought, but we've also seen some of the pitfalls, and I think being aware of those, I just wanted to pick up on the your your autobiography that you've that you've written, uh, Medicine in Remote Places, and in that you give some advice for for young mission partners going out. Could you perhaps share a few kind of uh, I would encourage people, you know, read the book, but um, <laughs> but can you perhaps pick up on a, a few of the kind of the positive things to strive for going coming from our kind of missionary heritage and and, and things from the past that we could avoid um, yeah. doing it, mission now? Yeah. It's very kind of you to call it an autobiography. I didn't intend it as that, more <laughs> just as a reflection, but I, I tried to cover our Africa years. I, what would I pull from that as take homes from that. Well, I believe fundamentally for every follower of Jesus Christ, particularly when we are young, but not just when we're young, we need to constantly seek God's will for our lives. We believe that God has a plan and purpose for us, that he has, his will is that we come to know him as Lord and Savior, Jesus as Lord and Savior, but more than that, his will is that we live for him and we use whatever gifts and ability he's given us in his service. And that may be through our daily work in our secular employment, whatever it is, you know, we seek God's will for that. So, so that to me is very important. And when I was young, uh, discovering God's will was something I was taught about a lot. And sometimes it became very complicated. You felt you were walking through a maze sometime and God was playing hide and seek with you. And I don't believe that's the case. I believe very strongly that, you know, God works, walks with us. So things that God, ex God does and things that God expects us to do. And I often say that, you know, often God gives us desires, puts, plants desires in our hearts and he expects us to follow these desires up. So, when I was about 19 and became serious about my Christian faith, I had a desire to start studying the scriptures. So I spent a lot of time in these years in Bible study, many, many hours every week. I, and that increased my thirst for Bible study. And I read and I developed my knowledge of, not that I knew everything, but at least I found my way about the Bible. He also gave me a desire to a, uh, to get in to serve in missions, so I thought, well, let me let's do a medical elective and abroad. Let's go to South Africa and let me see if I feel I can cope with this. And when I had that, when I fulfilled that desire, this confirmed, yeah, I think this is something I can do. And I think after the desires are are given to us, God then, God then, a uh, the desires deepen into convictions. You're setting the you're setting the your sails, if you like. You're setting the course of your life. You you the direction you're going to go. And as we go along, we're setting the course of our life. And it's not just the desire. Now we're convinced about what we should be doing and how we should be serving God. And then often at that stage, <clears throat> when you're moving along this pathway, God brings something into your life, a challenge, a letter, a meeting, a conversation, something that speaks to you. And that's when you have got to decide. You know, God doesn't do for us yeah. what we must do for ourselves. He doesn't. We, we make the decisions. He puts the desires there. He gives us the convictions. He brings the signals to us. We make the decisions. And as we, you know, as we go step by step, he walks with us. Mm. What's the psalm? As you go step by step, I will be with you. Mm. Yeah, I've often thought as well that um, the more you spend time in his mm. presence and the more you listen to what he's saying, the more you're influenced by the direction you're going to go. So. Yeah. And part of that is that as we grow and we develop, we need to develop a robust spirituality and a disciplined life. Yeah. I think discipline is very important in the Christian life. Mm -hmm. If people are undisciplined, I, I think they do not usually make good mission workers. 
because often you're working, you you may be remote, working in a remote place, you may be working on your own, you may have very little local accountability. If you're not disciplined, you can fritter away your time. Yeah, sure. And I think to me, developing as you as you go as you go on with God, a robust spirituality and a disciplined life is very important. Now, I often say, you know, there's no special room at Heathrow that uh, you go in and you're given an anointing of the Holy Spirit so that you become all the things you're not. And what you I've are, abro quote, what, you are abroad, you <laughs> what you are at home is just an extension of yeah, what absolutely. you are at, yeah. are at home. And so yeah. therefore discipline is very important. Well, they're important lessons to pick up from that mm. perspective. So looking to the future, what do you think the lasting impact of mission uh, has been over the years, particularly if you think of, I guess, your experience in Zambia mm -hmm. and India as well. What are the things that we can pick up and focus in on? I remember sitting at the centenary conference at Mambalima in, in eastern Zambia. Mambalima was John, formerly Johnson Falls and one of the first mission bases established in in, in there. Uh, in Zambia, in Northern Rhodesia, as it was, and actually my uncle Dugo Campbell was one of the first establishers of that. And I was there for their centenary conference, and uh, probably fifteen to 20,000 people attended that, not all at the same time, and we were sitting on the banks of the Luapula River looking over to Congo, and uh, I remember in the Sunday morning, 5,000 of us shared the Lord's Supper together, and it took an age to pass the bread round <laughs> and the cups. But all the the Bembas were beautiful singers, the Bembas, and they were singing hymns in their rich voices. And uh, I remember thinking, gosh, 100 years ago, this was witchcraft, yeah. darkness, slavery, you know, all sorts of social evils going on in this community. And now here you've got 5,000 Christians together following Jesus Christ and wanting to live for him. Yeah. That's an impact, isn't yeah. it? That's a phenomenal impact. And then a few years say, after that, I, I was speaking at a Bible school in India, in South India, in Kerala, and they, they had about 50 to 60 students. And it was just a, 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 a male-only school. But there's about, I remember looking at these young lads and they, they were preparing themselves for ministry and service in India. And just being overcome by the thought, you know, here's the generation. You know, it's yeah. not white Anglo-Saxon missionaries yeah. anymore or North Americans. It's Indians whom God has prepared. But what was done by the generations who went to India in the past, they built the foundations and now... Got their, these foundations are being built on and people are being prepared for, for ministry. So to me, that was a, a very important a, a reminder of the impact of the past on the present and the future. Sure. Yeah. It's been a, a really fascinating conversation, actually, and just to hear that you know hear some of the stories and uh, and your own reflections, though, Ian. And I think. As we sort of draw it to a close, we, we like to draw these these episodes mm -hmm. to a close it, with with what can be prayed for, mm -hmm. and that's a maybe a slightly more of an abstract one when we think of history. But I still think it's quite relevant when we think of the long term legacy of the missionary movement of the of the last couple of centuries. In, in a sense, it doesn't it hasn't stopped. You know, it's not a yeah. static thing. Uh, so, what can we be praying for that kind of, you know? based on what the Lord has done, is to what we could ask the Lord for now, mm. uh, based off of what's already happened? I would say we should be praying for the frontliners. Mm. Uh, and these frontliners will not generally be British origin workers. There'll be some there, but they will be Indians or Africans or Latin Americans or Chinese or Asians and so on. These will be the frontliners. And thank God for that. That's where mission is now. And uh, it shouldn't uh, fill our heart with sadness that we've, we're sending fewer missionaries in the past. But, you know, there's still a vital work of God going on. And I think we need to pray for the frontliners that they keep their priorities right, that they fulfill their ministry and they don't become discouraged. Because if you're in a tough place, and if you're not seeing an advance, then uh, it's very easy to become discouraged. And now in the sort of Western number counting format, if I can't write home and tell that in this very hard Muslim community, I've seen converts, people will say, well, what are you doing? You know, And they do not realize in some situations it takes a long time to 
to break to break the ice. A few years ago, I was in a conference, on, nearly 30 years ago, I was in a conference in Germany, and it was a conference on, on work in the Islamic world. And I had not long joined ECOWAS, and really I was learning about the Muslim world for the first time. And what I was learning was really, you know, stretching my mind and making me aware of the hugeness of the challenge. And one of the contrib contributors, one of the persons present there was a a German called Daniel Hearn. And Daniel had been the principal of the Vidaness Bible School for several years. And, you know, sometimes we were getting a bit discouraged as we heard what was going on. And he said, let me tell you about my father. Between the wars, my father served among the Bulgarian Turks in the mountains of Bulgaria. And this was a Muslim group. And he would go around from village to village in the summer. In the winter, he would pull his sledge and he would take Bibles and he'd take literature and he'd go from village to village. And didn't see any response, didn't meet any converts. And then the war came along and uh, he had to leave. Never was able to return after the Second World War. So he probably spent about 15 or more years there trying to evangelize that group. And he said, we're not sowing the seed. We're not even plowing the ground. He says, all we're doing is we're removing a few rocks from the surface and maybe things will happen. In the 1970s, some men came into a Christian bookshop in West Germany, as it was then, and they came from that area. And they were looking for Bibles in their language. And they said, oh, are there Christians in Europe? Oh, yes, there are several groups of Christians. I can't remember the number. It's too long ago. And how did you become Christians? Well, they said, between the wars, there was an old man who used to drag his sledge around and come to our villages and give Bibles and talk about Jesus. And uh, he left some literature behind him. We read it. And one day someone in the village became very ill. So he thought, let's pray in the name of Jesus. And the person got better. And so we read the New Testament and we read, the, we read what literature we had and we came. And now there are several groups of believers there. And to me, that was a very uplifting story at that time, you know. What seemed to be not achieving anything in that man's eyes in subsequent years showed that the good seed of the Word of God did provide a harvest. So pray for the frontliners that they won't become discouraged. Pray that their, their needs will be met. Uh, many indigenous workers from other parts of the world that are not as well off struggle. Uh, to meet their needs, to pay for school education, for medical bills and so on. And uh, so we need to pray that God will provide for their needs. And if we are able to help towards meeting that, then we should be willing that. The other thing that I always say is pray that these workers in the front lines, marriages will be kept strong. And the families will grow for God. Because if there's tension in the marriage and if the family are not supportive in the ministry this can be a struggle as well so just mm -hmm. practical points pray for the frontliners pray that their needs will be met pray for their marriages and pray for their families i have i have a suspicion that we'll come back to you because this has been <laughs> such an enormous mm. subject i think you might be a regular contributor as we launch this podcast but just let me say thank you for taking the time it's pleasure. been really much appreciated thank you pleasure to be with you god bless you Thank you for listening to The Same Commission. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so to continue hearing more about mission. And praying for the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ to reach all nations. To learn more about Echoes International and how you can serve in or support mission, visit our website at echoesinternational.org.uk or follow us on our social media channels. Thank you and see you next time on The Same Commission.